Hey everybody, welcome to True Crime Paranormal. I'm Christy Brower here with my partner in crime, Katie Weaver. Hey Katie. Hello. We're excited to be here with you and bringing you our next installment of True Crime Paranormal and our next installment on the Kaneko case, which we started yep. last week. We're going to be doing episode two. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of uh, interesting information to share, sort of, I don't know, stunning, bizarre information to share. Yeah, we do. It's a long list of stuff. But if yeah. you haven't watched um, episode one, you definitely want to go back and do that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we're talking about the the deaths of Lara and Lorraine Kaneko and um, the, the father and husband in the situation, David Kaneko, who ultimately was charged with their deaths. And so we told a, a pretty, unfortunately, macabre story in our last episode about how they were found uh, partially mummified, laying next to each other on a bed in, in David Kaneko's house. Uh, Lara had been dead for two for three years and uh, Lorraine had been dead for one at this point. So we kind of told that story to kick it off and, you know, give you the background. And today we're going to do, Katie's going to go do a little bit of a, a background on each member of the family, a little bit about what we know about them. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about David's trial and what the FBI profilers figured out and some things like that. So, okay. Take it away, Katie. All right. Well, let's start with David. So David, of course, is dad, uh, husband of this mess. And mm -hmm. he, so, and, and this is info that came from their obituaries. So he was born in Salina, Utah, and went to school in Utah. He went to Brigham Young University and graduated with a bachelor's and then a master's degree in biology. He spent several years in the Air Force, and then he married Lorraine Sakota in the Idaho Falls Temple, the Idaho Falls Latter-day Saint Mormon Temple. Uh, they moved around for a little while, and then they settled down in Rexburg, where they had one daughter. He worked at the NRF, which essentially is the, the site or the uh, Idaho National Lab, from 1976 to 2003, teaching Navy students chemistry and radiological controls. And then, um, you know, of course, he was preceded in death by his wife and daughter, as we know. And he mm -hmm. died in 2016. So, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, uh, you know, he, he had gone to great lengths to try to get off of probation before he died or, or mm -hmm. to get his felony dropped. Uh, before he died, which uh, didn't happen, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, he had cancer and ended up uh, passing away. So mm -hmm. th that's what we know about David. Uh, we know that David was extremely intelligent, extremely yeah. intelligent. And you'll discover that uh, it runs in the family. So let's talk about Lorraine, mama. So Kayo Lorraine Sakota. So her first name was actually Kayo, and of course David's first name was actually Kenichi, but they mm -hmm. went by uh, their middle names. So anyway, Kayo was her first name, but she was born in Rexburg and went to Madison High School, just like us. And mm -hmm. she graduated in 63. She was one of the class valedictorians. In high school, she was in the Future Teachers of America Club Commercial Club, mm -hmm. Future Homemakers of America, the Peppers Pep Club, the Student <laughs> Council. I know that's cute, huh? Yeah. We didn't really have Pep Club by the time we came along. It was a well, little different. It wasn't called the Peppers, that's for sure. Right? How come we didn't get to be Peppers? Yeah, because we were band nerds. That's, that's true. We were in the pep <laughs> band. <laughs> That's true. Okay. She was on the student council. She was a girl federation officer. I was also not familiar with that girl federation officer. Mm -mm. I don't know. Uh, she was on the library and office staff. She was honored as the October student of the month. I thought it was really sweet that that was included. <laughs> yeah. She graduated from Rick's college. Rick's college is a Mormon college. It's now, uh, Brigham Young University, Idaho, but at the time it was Ricks College uh, here in Rexburg with an associate's degree and then graduated 
uh, summa cum laude from Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, with a bachelor's degree in elementary education. And then she married Kenichi David Kaneko on... So they met at BYU, is They that? met at BYU, yep. They got married in 1969 in the Idaho Falls Mormon Temple. And she taught school for a while in Spanish Fork, Utah, while he was working on his master's degree in zoology at BYU. Mm. So he must, he had multiple degrees. Uh, because of his job, they moved around quite a bit for a while. They were in Cincinnati, they were in Denver, and then they came back to Rexburg. And that's where they had their daughter. She was, of course, a member of the LDS Church and served in lots of different callings in the church. Uh, last calling on the Stake Relief Society Board at Ricks College. And then, of course, they had one daughter. And as we know, she passed away sometime prior to June 19th, 2004. So sounds like teaching was kind of a, must have been her passion, considering that she was in the Future Teachers of America Club and then went mm -hmm. on to do so. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, education was really important, obviously, to this family. Yeah, but, yeah, it certainly seemed to be. Though it seems like maybe once they came to Rexburg and she had her daughter, maybe she didn't teach after that. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it. All right, and then Laura. Laura is the daughter. So Laura was born, she was actually born in Utah in Spanish Fork. Her birthday was the 23rd of June, 1970. Mm. Yeah, I know. She was a cancer and her birthday was one day before mine. Now y'all yes. know. Yes, <laughs> Christy and I both went. Mm. But not the same year. <laughs> no, no. No, she was a little older than me. All righty. So she did all of her schooling in Rexburg, graduated from Madison High School in 1988 as one of the valedictorians. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Her mama did too. Yep. Her honors included the KPVI Channel 6 Award, the Bo Bosch and Loam Outstanding S uh, Science Student Award, the Westinghouse mm -hmm. Family Scholarship, and the Ricks College Presidential Scholarship and the Seroptimus Club Scholarship. So she had a lot of scholarships heading into college. She mm -hmm. was on the Honor Society. She was the chapter president of the Honor Society, in fact. She was the co-president of the Madison Avenue Dancers, which was kind of a, like a ballroom dance club. Mm -hmm. They still had that when we were there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they did. We weren't in it because, again, band nerds. Band nerds, yeah. <laughs> Okay, she was on the youth legislature. She was in the key club, which was kind of a service club. She was on the seminary council and the school newspaper. She lettered in music and was a representative to the Idaho Business Week and Girls State. Mm -hmm. She started and maintained a student to student tutoring program for Madison High and junior high students. She went to Ricks College majoring in pre-med graduating as a valedictorian with an associate's degree from Ricks College. Again, another valedictorian. During her entire schooling from kindergarten through Ricks College, Laura had a straight A 4.0 grade point average, which included many advanced math and science courses. She had many callings in her church, which included twice being the Relief Society president at Ricks College. Uh, and as we know, she died sometime prior to June 19th, 2004. They believe it was more around 2001. Yeah, so, May or June 2001. Mm -hmm. So that's what we know about them as people. I know people who knew Laura. I didn't. She was just a little too much older than us. Yeah, she know. was five me in school. So. Mm -hmm. But I do know people who knew her who said that she was extremely kind always had a smile on her face, was always willing to go out of her way to help other people, and was just generally everybody's friend. Wow. Yeah. Well, you look at the situation and you go, okay, where did this go so wrong? Yeah. And, and we do have some information about that. Not all, you know, we certainly don't know everything because unfortunately, David was very uncooperative in the investigation and in the trial. And so there are many things that are not known because mm -hmm. he wouldn't speak. He just wouldn't say. Mm -hmm. 
But one of the things that uh, the, the local police did, they were super duper burned by this case. Mm -hmm. I kind of think this case was sort of like prepping the local legal system for the Daybell case. Right. The Daybell Vallow case. Because they'd never dealt with anything like this no. before. And uh, the sheriff at the time, Roy Klingler, talked about the trauma that um, his officers experienced and that some of them actually needed some mental health because of what they went through. It took nine days to clear this house out and go through all the evidence. And that was after moving the bodies and finding yeah. the bodies. And this was not something that local police here were used to at all. So yeah. they knew that they were in over their heads from the very beginning. And so they, they reached out to the FBI and they asked to get uh, a, a profiler involved because they felt like mm -hmm. they needed something to help them. And it turned out that um, it takes like a year to get a profiler to even be able to take a case. But at the time wow. that this case happened, at the time that they found the bodies, there was a conference going on for FBI profilers in Alaska. And they said, if you fly up here, you could probably talk to a room full of profilers and maybe get some info. And that's what they did. Uh, Klingler, um, Sheriff Klingler and a couple other officers, they went to Alaska and they got to actually talk to a whole room of profilers and lay out this whole thing. So one of the things that they did, one of the profilers asked for the journals, because we talked about this last time, there were thousands of pages of journaling. And some of it was really, um, like really OCD stuff, like writing down when the furnace turned off and on. And a lot of it was like prophetic dreams and all this stuff that, that Laura had been predicting was going to happen. And, and uh, so they, with the help of the FBI, they were able to identify the two women's handwriting and kind of split out who wrote what. And the profiler, this, this woman that she was a psychologist and she looked through this stuff and she through through the writings and through what happened, she diagnosed Lara with schizoaffective disorder. So schizoaffective disorder is a, is a psychotic disorder. It is think of it like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in combo. And apparently given some family history, this profiler indicated that that had started to present itself in Laura in her teen years, but then got significantly worse as she got older. Laura was never treated or saw a doctor or was on any kind of medication. This is definitely the kind of illness that is only manageable with medication. Now, isn't, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't this a disorder that typically does manifest towards the end of the teen years? Yes, it is. That's, that's very common. That's generally when it will hit. And it was about that time or early 20s when Laura started predicting that she was going to marry this young man who was currently serving a, an LDS mission. And I've never known for sure if they if, if there was a specific person they had identified or if it was just someone on a mission. I never did find any information about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, that and that he was going to become an apostle or the prophet or the, the president of the Mormon church. So like if you're... A, a Mormon, that's a really big deal to marry okay. somebody that's going to be that high up in the leadership of the Mormon church. Yeah. So that's kind of, so then what happened, what this profiler, you know, says is that what happened is that mom started to buy into Laura's delusions. So Laura is delusional. This is part of her mental illness. She believes 100% this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And mom starts to buy into it. And what, it can create something called a collective delusion where mom actually starts to exhibit the same mental illness symptoms as daughter. They were very isolated. They didn't leave the house. They didn't talk to anybody. It was and, and David worked at the site. He was mm -hmm. gone long hours which meant it was just the two of them at home over and over again, confirming the delusion over and over and over again. And mm -hmm. somewhere in that delusion, they decided that they had to purify themselves to be prepared, maybe to be worthy. That's a really, really mm -hmm. common term in Mormonism. You have to be worthy for things to happen. Mm -hmm. And so in that somewhere they decided in order to be worthy. And, and, and I don't know if this comes from, you know, Mormons fast once Sunday a month, um, and and a lot of a lot of things to bring something 
uh, good to happen or to heal a problem. Fasting is a thing that Mormons do. Mm -hmm. Fasting so, and prayer. Yeah. Fasting and prayer. Yeah. So uh, somewhere I think that their doctrine got mixed in with this mental illness because they decided that they had to really start restricting their diet. They had to pull away from everyone socially, which they were kind of already doing. Apparently that was, that started like even in like the mid nineties, they were pulling away mm -hmm. and there had been there, there, room, there were rumored of family fallout, but there was never any clear identification of what that was. Yeah. Do you they think start really initially that maybe they started pulling back because they were embarrassed about Laura's condition or what was happening with her? I mean, do you think this is how maybe they were managing Or that her? they shared this delusion and people mm -hmm. were like, oh, that seems kind of crazy. Why are, you, why are you believing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was well, related it's to so interesting to learn uh, what if they had been saying things at church, you know, yeah. that, that had concerned people because mm -hmm. they stopped going to church completely, which completely. is really unusual for, you know, mm -hmm. um, very hardcore Mormons. I mean, you go every Sunday, you don't miss church. But well, they especially going ones who are predicting that they're going to marry someone that will become the prophet of the church. Right, because you're totally not following the rules at that point and yeah. maybe wouldn't even... How are you going to meet a person like that to marry if you don't ever leave your house? <laughs> yeah. But we have to remember this is a mental illness. It's exactly. a delusion. Yeah. There's no reality to it. So no. it's just, it's no. going to happen. And mom just buys in. And these two are very, very close. They spend all their time yeah. together. And so mom starts to um, exhibit similar symptoms to daughter. And this can happen. Mm -hmm. This is not an isolated case. That, that, that can happen where a shared delusion can sort of spread into a family. So they started um, restricting what they could eat. Mm -hmm. And we know that, you know, the only thing they can really truly identify as, as killing them was malnutrition. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of interesting stuff in the house about dates and how much had been eaten and stuff like that written on boxes and stuff. Mm -hmm. They were keeping track. It was pretty clear they were keeping track of maybe how much they were allowed to eat. Mm -hmm. So this went on for quite a few years. I mean, the the first welfare check happened in 1997. Yeah. And they didn't actually find the bodies until 2004. So we're talking about, or, or 2003. 2003. Yeah. yeah. So we're talking about a six-year period here. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. 2004. Yeah. It is four. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. right. Because Lorraine died in 2003. Yeah. So it's a seven-year period in which they are seriously restricting yeah. food. They're also not seeing a doctor. Mm -hmm. The thing you got to know about a psychotic disorder like schizoaffective disorder is, is Laura has gets deeper and deeper into the delusions and, and potentially hallucinations as she yeah. has psychotic episodes that is damaging her brain and going unchecked. There's, there's literal damage occurring. Mm -hmm. I mean, schizophrenia is a degenerate degenerative brain disease. Yeah. And so she's, her, her brain is damaged is getting damaged over time. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it, that would have killed her, but it certainly would have just exacerbated her illness and made it worse. Sure. And, she, and her function got poorer and poorer. Sure. Um, you know, the, of course, the question was at the time for the police, what's David's involvement in all of this? How did he just stand back and let his wife and daughter starve themselves to death and keep their bodies in the house? And what, you know? Yeah. He, he said very little. Um, but what he did say mm -hmm. was that he thought this was all part of the plan uh -huh. and that Lorraine and Laura had a plan and they were following through with it. And so he didn't want to, you Interfere know, get in the way of that. Plan. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of, um, there have been accusations made against David that he was controlling of them and that he was the one holding them away from other people in their lives. I don't know if that's true or if it was a combination of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they literally were basically living next door to uh, Lorraine's parents and David went to work for like 10 or 12 hours a day. They could have left the house. They could have made a phone call, but they didn't. So we don't know if there was domestic violence there, if there was abuse there. There doesn't appear to be any history. The only um, criminal history that David has is about this case. There were never any domestic violence charges against him. But there are questions about why why did they do that, you know, mm -hmm. and was he expecting that? But it seems that everyone in the household bought into this delusion. Mm -hmm. 
that this was going to happen and Laura knew what she was supposed to be doing to make it happen and that mom and dad bought in. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I don't want to oversimplify it because I think there was more to it than that. Sure. But that's kind of the mental health side of it. Yeah. And, and I do think, you know, thinking about the time that this happened and where they lived, there's still a huge stigma about mental illness oh, in, yeah. in the Mormon community. There is. Mm -hmm. And even now, you know, this many years later, it, it it's still there. Yeah. And so to go admit that your daughter who was the valedictorian and, you know, has done all these things is now, you know, having delusions and hallucinations and is, you know, doing some scary stuff. I, I, I can see why they would just keep her at home and not tell anybody. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Just, uh, yeah, I, it's not like that's the only time that's ever happened. No, nope, not at all. Not at all. It but also just point. makes me wonder where has mom's mental health been over the years, you right. know, leading up to this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, schizoaffective disorder, it's one of those things that has a, you know, schizophrenia, those kinds of illnesses do have a tendency to um, be passed along in mm -hmm. families. Uh, so it could have come either from mom or from dad or, yeah. you know, a combination of the two. Yeah. It, it, it's not fully understood as an illness, but it's, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence now to, to follow it back in, in family history. And so, sure. you know, chances are good that there was something there that, mm -hmm. but the way that both David and Lorraine just sort of bought in and went along with it literally to their deaths is, mm -hmm. is so disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. That at well, no point either of them went, this is not okay. We have to get some help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were you couldn't have expected Laura to that. do that. She would have been unable to do that. There were probably prophecies about that, you know? Mm -hmm. There probably were. They were probably forbidden from discussing this outside of their family. It was probably mm -hmm. a, you know, if, if you do this, this won't happen kind of a, you know, that that's right. my gut feeling on it is that there was... There was, she had some real strict instructions on how, you know, this was or wasn't to be shared and, you know, as yeah. far as what was going on with her. It also seems to me like Laura was really Lorraine's whole life, yeah. you know. I mean, they only had the one child, which is kind of, you know, rare in, in Mormonism. A lot of LDS families have a household of kids. And right. uh, to only have one Frankly, usually it's because there's a medical problem or something, you know, mm -hmm. it's true. people in this faith don't choose to only have one child, you know, and now don't be at me right now. If you are LDS and you choose, chose to have one child, that's fine. It's no problem. But, you know, mm -hmm. but in is, general, in general, most LDS families have a lot of kids. And yeah. so, and because she was a teacher, an elementary mm -hmm. teacher, and yeah. she clearly adored children. The fact that they only had one kid, I think, is kind of interesting. And, mm -hmm. you know, but also it does seem like, you know, Laura was her whole world. Yeah. Yeah, she really was, I, I think, to, a, to a, a very unhealthy degree. Yeah. 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 So they got that information from the profiler. Um, you know, and she basically said this is a treatable condition had they taken her to a psychiatrist. Mm hmm that she would have been treated, but of course her ability to judge reality would have deteriorated significantly, particularly untreated. It would have continued to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So initially there was no indication that Lorraine had a mental illness, but the profiler felt like she really devolved and that you could see it in her writing in the journals as well over time. Mm -hmm. And she did say it was, you know, she believed because of their close relationship and their social isolation that she just started to believe it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the thing is that the weird thing for investigators was that as all this is happening, David just continues to go to work. Yeah. And function in society mm -hmm. like everything's fine. Yeah. When clearly it was definitely not fine. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it, he came off as everything is fine because one of the um, witnesses that they called in his trial was a supervisor from his work at the INL because he had been written up for excessive overtime mm -hmm. and for staying the night at the INL way too many times. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to sleep out there if you need to. 
but he'd done it way mm -hmm. too much. And so it appeared that he was staying away from home quite a lot. Mm -hmm. The last time that the police were at the house and spoke to Lorraine, she told them that he had been, he had slept away from the house 64 days in one year mm -hmm. and they didn't know where he was at those times. Yeah. We know some of that time was at the site. Maybe some of it was in a hotel. We don't know. But at this point, it did seem like he was staying away. Mm -hmm. not, not all the time, but there, you know, he wasn't there as much. And so this may have started to get to him some. Yeah. Not that he actually got any help. Not that he talked to anybody or, you know, got any support because he just didn't. Yeah. So after they found the women's bodies and they're trying to figure out what to do and how how to charge him you know they can't imagine that he doesn't have some involvement some culpability here he lived with them right and and kept their bodies after death so yeah. the prosecutor at the time sid brown um charged him with a misdemeanor for obstructing an officer for lying uh to the police about mm -hmm. the situation and that was the first charge he had so that they could hold him so then um, the prosecutor got a $500,000 material witness bond yeah. to make sure that he stuck around and couldn't take off. And by this time, he was retired from the INL. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of, our, one of our listeners brought up something from our last episode that I think is, is key that we should talk about because there's so little information about this case out there. And she said, one, one of our listeners suggested, well, is it because of the site where things kept hush hush because he was a high clearance employee working in, you know, nuclear stuff out there. And, you know, that actually makes a lot of sense because uh -huh, I think uh -huh. a lot of things get kind of quashed and, and held quietly around the INL. We've seen that all our lives. Yeah. Um, because it is strange. As big a case as this was in our community, mm -hmm. if you go search it, you will read you know, 15 news articles that all say the same thing. Like there's oh, yeah. so little information. Practically out there. everything is just regurgitated. Yeah. For sure. yeah. Well, the INL, absolutely. Uh, the LDS church as well, you know, mm -hmm. definitely, it, it's definitely very typical yeah. around here for crimes to be brushed under the rug to, to be kept really quiet. When I was at Rick's college also a gazillion years ago, mm -hmm. I, in the i was in the home economics department and our advisor called you know our all us uh, students in us girls and she said i need you girls to know that already this semester there have been seven sexual assaults on campus well yep. that was news to us because no one had ever said anything about that and mm. she was recognizing that nobody was talking about the uncomfy things you know the things that didn't paint the school or, or maybe the town or the church in a good light and so you know and and so of course her warning to us was don't go anywhere alone you know you, you're not safe on campus by yourself you're not safe in this town at night by yourself quit thinking right. that you are you know and then i was always very grateful for that knowledge because i have been doing that very thing you know mm -hmm. on campus alone at night to take tests and to sew and to whatever but anyway right. But, and I only tell that story as just as a, you know, a, an illustration of the hush hush uh, attitude around here for many, many, many years around various oh, yeah. crimes. Well, I mean, what is it, 10 or 15 years ago? Until 10 or 15 years ago, the, the college had their own police force. Yes. It was completely illegal police, police mm -hmm. force, but it was, a, it was tolerated clear until probably 2005 or something. At least, yeah. And so they would investigate their own crimes. Mm -hmm. which meant that things didn't necessarily get reported out to the regular police and yeah. didn't go in news of record. And, you know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of, finally the state police came out and said, look, this is illegal. You can't do this, but they'd been allowing it for decades up yeah. to that point. Yeah. And then, so now, I mean, crime on campus there gets reported and you see it in the news and mm -hmm. but boy, when we were kids, you know how we knew about news that happened up there? our dad because he was the town barber he was mm -hmm. the prosecutor the sheriff the judges the the um president of the university he was the barber for all those people mm -hmm. so we knew stuff that nobody else did because they would tell him in the barber chair yeah you know how people are when they get their hair done they just spill their guts you yeah. know and so he knew mm -hmm. if you wanted to know anything in town you call you him. ask him because he knew he either did know or he'd find out real soon Yep. <laughs> he would. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, it, so yeah, I mean, it, it's weird that this case has got such little information, but in, in a way it's really not considering where it is. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there I, I'm really other, you, you what? Know, there have been other yeah. crimes and situations in Rexburg that were uh, just completely you know, quashed. It, it, this isn't a surprise. And this was why when the Daybell case broke, a lot of people were really worried that yes. that's exactly what was going to happen and that there wouldn't be justice for those kids because members would cover for each other. And, you know, luckily that is not at all what's happened. Frankly, I think social media has made that damn hard to do, you know? Well, it has, it's also because of East Idaho News. East yeah. Idaho News is a new, it's an all online based news service in the area. Mm -hmm. And they're quite new, what, five years, yeah. maybe a little more in our community. And they, like they have a helicopter. I mean, they cover things in, in a way that our other local news really doesn't. No. They don't go out and do the legwork like East Idaho News does. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you can really see a difference that things don't get shoved away. If something like this happened now, it would not be so hush-hush. Oh, no. Nate Eaton would be relentless. Yeah, for he sure. He would. He would. For sure. And it's sad because, you know, the people who lived in this community don't know the truth about this case for sure. And... I don't know. I, 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 it makes me sad for the families involved, you know, did they ever really know? Yeah. So I, no, you know? Yeah. 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 So they, they really struggled with this case, trying to figure out how to charge David. They actually invoked a special magistrate hearing, which is something that's really unusual to do. It was the first time that Sid Brown had ever done it in Madison County in his whole career. Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they put David Kaneko's psychologist under oath and so that they, and, and basically he had to waive client, uh, doctor client privilege um, so that they could get some answers because they were trying to decide if a crime had been committed here mm -hmm. because they couldn't prove that they, that they were murdered, you know? Right. Um, David Kaneko was also supposed to testify at that hearing, but he pled the fifth. He never really said anything no. of substance at all. No. So this is a secret hearing. Nobody knew about it. They're just investigating and trying to decide if a crime has been committed. And so they did get some information from the psychologist um, that what what Kaneko had told the psychologist kind of matched what he told the police and that the psychologist didn't feel that he was lying. So the, the, mm -hmm. the pathologist reports, both of them, you know, the two different autopsies they did. And then this psychologist and what David had reported kind of all matched up, which gave them at least some idea that they weren't going to charge him with murder because they really couldn't prove it. Yeah. Um, Sid Brown worked with the Idaho Attorney General's office for weeks, trying to, well, years, literally. They didn't charge yeah. him until, until 2006. Yeah. So, so they didn't charge years. him for two years. Two years. Yeah. But people have been antsy about, uh, you know, murder charges coming down in the Daybell case. Come on, guys. Yeah. Two years. Two years. Yeah. Well, the autopsies took a long, long time. Forever. And then they did a second set. And so a lot of that time was spent waiting on the yeah. autopsies as well and just investigating trying to get something because they couldn't get anything out of him and there was just no one else to ask they were so yeah. isolated yeah that there was nobody else that knew anything no. so they charged him with five felonies on april 10th of 2006 two counts of involuntary manslaughter two counts of abandonment of a vulnerable adult and one count of desertion which is spousal de desertion so the the prosecutor said that he said, we looked at each possible criminal offense and I'm comfortable and confident that the stuff we charged him with was what the evidence supported. So they yeah. felt like they could actually make the case for this. Uh, let's see. They tried to mediate the case. They really tried to get him to plead it down because they just felt like it seemed silly to go to court on this. I mean, the bodies were found in the house with him. They know, you know. Yeah. So finally in June of that year, they were able to strike a deal with David. So in exchange for a guilty plea and $40,000 to help cover the county's costs, uh, Sid Brown agreed to drop all but the two counts of involuntary manslaughter. So he did believe that the defense could have argued that the charges were basically all the same thing and that they couldn't charge him all, with all of those. So mm -hmm. he just dropped him to the involuntary manslaughter. 
Um, you know, they, he says, we think he basically neglected two vulnerable adults. And because of that neglect, they died. Mm -hmm. um, so they were, you know, okay with the, you know, the, the county felt okay with how it came out. But they still don't really know why. Why didn't he report the deaths? Why didn't he ever get any help? You know, he um, served six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he served six months for this. That's the yep. other part that's, I think, a little tough to take. I can I can only imagine what it must have felt like to Lorraine and Laura's family for oh, him to, to only to go the away. To the Dakota family, I can't even yeah. imagine for him to go away for six months. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, he was offered the opportunity of a withheld judgment, right? Right. That if he carried forth with everything he was supposed to do, that at some point they could clear, clean those off of his record. Why yeah. does it matter? It matters because of his church. Right. Because if you are convicted of a felony, you will be excommunicated from your church or from from Mormon church and so you know I am assuming that throughout this process he was excommunicated from the church what that means we don't all, know for sure but we don't know for sure but I I really suspect that's the case because mm -hmm. in 2013 he was back in court asking them to uh go ahead and apply that withheld judgment and clean his record up, get those felonies off. Uh, he said he really wanted that, needed that to happen before he died. Well, that is, that's the religious factor, you know. It is, yeah. He wants those off because in Mormon doctrine, he and his wife were married in a temple, and that means that their daughter was sealed to them for time and all eternity. And if one of you is excommunicated from the church, then those uh, those vows are now invalidated, and right. so the belief there is that families will be together in you know once they die you can be together forever, so long as you've you know done all of these things that you've been asked to do, and, and you know kept the right. rules and, and are in good standing with the church, and so the fact that he, I'm presuming, was excommunicated over, you know, all of this stuff. And because he had two felonies, I mean, that's, that's just kind mm -hmm. of, that's just how it is. You know, right. he was trying to get that, those felonies gone so that he could uh, basically be initiate it. those vows with his, with his yeah. deceased wife. Does that, is that explained well enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but the judge said no. He saw Judge Mueller in 2013, said, uh, you know, I've done my time. I followed the rules. I'd like, you know, the withheld judgment. And he said, no. He said, you have not, uh, it, it hasn't been nearly long enough for us to even consider that. Right. Well, and, and frankly, an involuntary manslaughter case gets offered withheld judgment. I mean, withheld judgment is usually like misdemeanors, minor yeah. stuff. Like if you show mm -hmm. you're going to clean up and not get in any trouble anymore yeah. we'll wipe your record after five years that kind of thing mm -hmm. like involuntary manslaughter of your wife and daughter i can't believe they even offered it like right. that's just bizarre to me but yeah it didn't even go before the same judge and i'm sure that judge was like what the hell yeah no <laughs> you yeah. allowed two people two ill people to die to starve to death and die and then held on to their bodies in your house you don't deserve a withheld judgment yeah. It's that, insane. That was my thought too. That Judge Mueller probably went <laughs> not yeah. in this courtroom. Yeah, no. I, I I I wish that we had more details on why they offered that to begin with, and oh. maybe that was his request too. Maybe it was. Maybe it was I will plead guilty if. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I wonder because that's just such a strange thing to offer in a felony right. case like this. I don't I don't think that that's something that normally gets offered in felony cases. No, but that was a part of the gymnastics to avoid having a felony. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the, you know, the prosecutor's office said, made it very clear, they were trying really hard to not go to trial because the trial would be so expensive and it was so unnecessary. It's not like there was any question about what had happened here. You know, I mean, the, right. well, I mean, there's lots of questions, but definitely they died in his house and he hung onto their bodies. There was right, no there was no about question that. about who was involved. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. 
just interesting though because there's really no there's so little detail about like what did the psychologist in court don't know haven't been able to get the records haven't been able to get anything mm -mm. no it's weird it's kind of like it didn't happen yeah yeah I know yeah. it's it's strange yeah there's there's this element of it's almost like it didn't happen except we know it did you know we lived here when it happened yeah. I remember it I remember how horrifying it was uh, you know it was not something that was that that kind of thing doesn't happen here very often so it's not something you forget well and uh, poking around and asking about it people have acted very standoffish and suspicious you know we're apparently uh, breaching the polite barrier mm -hmm. you know? people don't want to talk about it. I will say that a friend of mine yeah. worked at Walmart at the time, and she told me that she was very familiar with David because he would come in once a week and purchase a large bundle of air fresheners and was constantly buying fans and air purifiers. And she had really wondered, what in the world does he need all of that for? And she said that had been going on for a few years, that every Friday he would come in and buy a bunch of that stuff from her. And so when this all broke, she was like, oh, oh, okay, mm -hmm. got it. But yeah, of course, you know, maybe good training for retail workers. Like, right. <laughs> she would have never suspected this is why, you know, but yeah, but, but it is funny. Not funny. It's, it's, it's a little unsettling, I think, how, uh, how hush things are around here, but Mm -hmm. It is. This it's very unsettling um, to to think that this happened, and this is the small amount of information we have. You know, yeah. we'll do a third episode on this if we can get some more info. We're going to keep trying to get mm -hmm. some more information and see if we can come back with some court records and you know give you a little bit more detail. But we wanted to share this case because you know I I, I think out of respect for. Laura and Lorraine, their story should be told. Absolutely. You know, it shouldn't just be hidden about what happened to them. They were hidden away for so long. You know, and I, yeah. I, I hope that we can get to maybe a little bit more truth about them. Absolutely. But yeah, their story deserves the light of day. Yeah, it yeah. does. It does. Well, that's our episode for tonight or this week, I guess. It's tonight right now, but I don't know when you'll be listening <laughs> to it. <laughs> but we want to say thank you for being here and listening. If you're listening on a podcast platform or if you're here on YouTube watching the show, we really appreciate you. We also love subscribes, likes, and shares, as you all know, comments. And we are on Patreon. And mm -hmm. you can find us over at Patreon. We're True Crime and Paranormal over there. And you can find us if you would like to support the work that we do. You get some free content that way. So yeah. definitely check that out. We do have a fan page and a discussion group on Facebook. Same name. So hit us up. You know, one thing we love is case suggestions. Uh, we try to get to, you know, we're always sifting through them to find some we like. Um, yeah. Please bring us unsolved cases because those are normally what we cover. Mm -hmm. I know this is a solved case, but, um, you know, we, we pick and choose some local stuff that we like to do as well as our usual format. But we do really mm -hmm. like to to present unsolved cases and then do a cold read on them about what we think happened. Yeah. And then, of course, this fall, keep your eyes peeled because we are planning out and getting ready for our cemetery tour. We're yes. going to see uh, hitting, I think, mostly Idaho. And now that mm -hmm. our research is rolling out, to, well, I really want to do my Idaho and Montana, but that's going to have to be, Montana's going to have to come later because there's so <laughs> much in Idaho that I want to do. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, cemeteries and show them off a little bit and show you guys some graves and talk about the people that are buried there and what their stories are because there's yeah. some really interesting ones out and about that we want to share with you guys and you know we've talked about it before but we're total cemetery geeks and mm -hmm. you know well and we learned last time we talked about this that many of you are as well mm -hmm. yep <laughs> so a lot of youtube comments about that yeah so you know unite <laughs> yeah but so yeah, we'll, when we've got the dates for that, we'll start sharing that. And mm -hmm. that's coming up probably in October. We're pretty mm -hmm. excited about it. We do have lots of fun stuff coming. We also have we a do. TikTok and we haven't done one thing mm -hmm. with it besides make it. But we really are thinking about starting to put some content on TikTok. So if you guys are TikTokers, come find us. But also if you want to see us put some stuff up on TikTok, let us know. 
you know, yeah. it's uh, it's a different platform for us than normal. But uh, well, we've kind of fallen down the TikTok uh, rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lately. totally. totally. Yeah, so. And there's a lot of true crime stuff on TikTok. Yeah, there so, is. It's really yeah, fun. We, we, that's our next uh, mountain to climb is yeah. TikTok. Well, I've been practicing on my own TikTok, you know, to figure out, you know, how to make a ticky deck. But <laughs> 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 I've made a few of my pigs and stuff now. So, yeah, we're Yeah, I've made a couple of dogs. We're, yeah, we're... Well, th those are our test subjects, our pigs and dogs and cats. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, come find us on TikTok too. And uh, we'll try to, uh, you know, get our shit together and put some things on it. <laughs> yeah, yes, we will. Well, thanks for being here with us. Of course, always drop us a, a comment and a like and a share. We appreciate you being mm -hmm. here. And this has been True Crime Paranormal. Have a great night. Take care, guys. <laughs>